It's Friday, March 18th, 2.10 p.m. I'm going to read Part 2 of Chapter 7 of Part 3 of Book 4, The Magical Memory. There is no more important task than the exploration of one's previous incarnations. It has been objected to reincarnation that the population of this planet has been increasing rapidly. Where do, these new, where do the new souls come from? It is not necessary to invent theories about other planets. It is enough to say that Earth is passing through a period when human units are being built up from the elements with increased frequency. The evidence for this theory springs to the eye. In what other age was there such puerility, such lack of race experience, such reliance upon incoherent formulas? Contrast the infantile emotionalism and credulity of the average, well-educated Anglo-Saxon with the shrewd common sense of the normal illiterate peasant. A large population of humanity today is composed of souls who are living the human life for the first time. Note especially the incredible spread of congenital homosexuality and other sexual deficiencies in many forms. These are the people who have not understood, accepted, and even used the formula of Osiris. Kin to them are the once born of William James, who are incapable of philosophy, magic, or even religion, but seek instinctively a refuge from the horror of contemplating nature, in soothing syrup affirmations such as those of Christian science, spiritualism, and all the sham occult creeds, as well as the emasculated forms of so-called Christianity. As Zoroaster says, explore the river of the soul, whence or in what order you have come. One cannot do one's true will intelligently unless one knows what it is. Liber T. Sharp gives instructions for determining this by calculating the resultant of the forces which have made one what one is, but this practice is confined to one's present incarnation. If one were to wake up in a boat on a strange river, it would be rash to conclude that the direction of the one reach visible was that of the whole stream. It would help very much if one remembered the bearings of previous reaches traversed before one's nap. It would further relieve one's anxiety when one became aware that a uniform and constant force was the single determinant of all the windings of the stream, gravitation. We could rejoice that even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to the sea. Liber T. Sharp describes a method of obtaining the magical memory by learning to remember backwards, but the careful practice of dharana is perhaps more generally useful. As one prevents the more accessible thoughts from arising, we strike deeper strata. Memories of childhood reawaken. Still deeper lies a class of thoughts whose origin puzzles us. Some of these apparently belong to former incarnations. By cultivating these departments of one's mind, we can develop them. We become expert. We form an organized coherence of these originally disconnected elements. The faculty grows with astonishing rapidity once the knack of the business is mastered. It is much easier for obvious reasons to acquire the magical memory when one has been shown for many lives to reincarnate immediately. The great obstacle is the phenomenon called Freudian forgetfulness. That is to say that though an unpleasant event may be recorded faithfully enough by the mechanism of the brain, we fail to recall it, or recall it wrong because it is painful. The Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud analyzes and illustrates this phenomenon in detail. Now, the king of terrors being death, it is hard indeed to look it in the face. Mankind has created a host of phantasmic masks. People talk of going to heaven, passing over, and so on. Banners flaunted from pasteboard towers of baseless theories. One instinctively flinches from remembering one's last as one does from imagining one's next death. This latter is a very valuable practice to perform. See Liber HHH. Also read up the Buddhist meditations on the Ten Impurities. The point of view of the initiate helps one immensely. As soon as one has passed this pons asinorum, or Latin literally ass's bridge, i.e. an obstacle for beginners, the practice becomes much easier. It is much less trouble to reach the life before last. Familiarity with death breeds contempt for it. It is a very great assistance to the beginner if he happened to have some intellectual grounds for identifying himself with some definite person in the immediate past. A brief account of Aleister Crowley's good fortune in this matter should be instructive. It will be seen that the points of contract vary greatly in character. 1. The date of Eliphas Levi's death was about six months previous to that of Aleister Crowley's birth. The reincarnating ego is supposed to take possession of the fetus at about this stage of development. Two. Eliphas Levi had a striking personal resemblance to Aleister Crowley's father. This, of course, merely suggests a degree of suitability from a physical point of view. 3. Aleister Crowley wrote a play called The Fatal Force, at a time when he had not read any of Eliphas Levi's works. The motive of this play is a magical operation of a very peculiar kind. The formula which Aleister Crowley supposed to be his original idea is mentioned by Levi. 
we have not been able to trace it anywhere else in such exact correspondence in every detail. 4. Aleister Crowley found a certain quarter of Paris incomprehensibly familiar and attractive to him. This was not the ordinary phenomenon of déjà vu, it was chiefly a sense of being at home again. He discovered long after that Levi had lived in the neighborhood for many years. 5. There are many curious similarities between the events of Eliphas Levi's life and that of Aleister Crowley. The intention of the parents that their son should have a religious career, the inability to make use of very remarkable talents in any regular way, the inexplicable ostracism which afflicted him, and whose authors seemed somehow to be ashamed of themselves, and the events relative to marriage, all these offer surprisingly close parallels. Levi, in deliberately abandoning him, withdrew his protection from his wife. She lost her beauty and intelligence, and became the prey of an aged and hideous pithecoid. Aleister Crowley's wife insisted upon doing her own will, as she defined it. This compelled him to stand aside. What happened to Madame Constant happened to her, although in a more violent and disastrous form. The characters of the two men present subtle identities in many points. Both seem to be constantly trying to recoil inseparable antagonisms. Both find it hard to destroy the delusion that men's fixed beliefs and customs may be radically altered by a few friendly explanations. Both show a curious fondness for out-of-the-way learning, preferring recondite sources of knowledge to regular ones. Both take names and costumes very seriously. They adopt eccentric appearances. Both inspire what can only be called panic fear in absolute strangers, who can give no reason whatever for a repulsion which sometimes almost amounts to temporary insanity. The ruling passion in each case is that of helping humanity. Both show quixotic disregard of their personal prosperity and even comfort, yet both display love of luxury and splendor. Both have the pride of Satan. 7. When Aleister Crowley became Frater Ulm and had to write his thesis for the grade of Adeptus Exemptus, he had already collected his ideas when Levi's Clave de Grands Mysteries fell into his hands. It was remarkable that he, having admired Levi for many years, and even begun to suspect the identity, had not troubled, although an extravagant buyer of books, to get his particular work. He found, to his astonishment, that almost everything that he had himself intended to say was there written. The result of this was that he abandoned writing his original work, and instead translated the masterpiece in question, Liber 46, The Key of the Mysteries. The style of the two men is strikingly similar in numerous subtle and deep-seated ways. The general point of view is almost identical. The quality of the irony is the same. Both take a perverse pleasure in playing practical jokes on the reader. In one point, above all, the identity is absolute. There is no third name in literature which can be put in the same class. Both take a perverse pleasure in playing practical jokes on the reader. In one point, above all, the identity is absolute. There is no third name in literature which can be put in the same class. The point is this. In a single sentence is combined sublimity and enthusiasm with sneering bitterness, skepticism, grossness, and scorn. It is evidently the supreme enjoyment to strike a chord composed of as many conflicting elements as possible. The pleasure seems to be derived from gratifying the sense of power, the power to compel every possible element of thought to contribute to the spasm. If the theory of reincarnation were generally accepted, the above considerations would make out a strong case. Frater Perturabo was quite convinced in one part of his mind of this identity, long before he got any actual memories as such. The publication of the biography of Eliphas Levi by M. Paul Schachernack has confirmed the hypothesis in innumerable striking ways. Unless one has a groundwork of this sort to start with, one must get back to one's life as best one can by the methods above indicated. It may be of some assistance to give a few characteristics of genuine magical memory, to mention a few sources of error, and to lay down critical rules for the verification of one's results. The first great danger arises from vanity. One should always beware of remembering that one was Cleopatra or Shakespeare. Again, superficial resemblances are usually misleading. One of the great tests of the genuineness of any recollection is that one remembers the really important things in one's life, not those which mankind commonly classes as such. For instance, Aleister Crowley does not remember any of the decisive events in the life of Eliphas Levi. He recalls intimate trivialities of childhood. He has a vivid recollection of certain spiritual crises, in particular one which was fought out as he placed up and down a lonely stretch of road in a flat and desolate district. He remembers ridiculous incidents, such as often happen at suppers when the conversation takes a turn that its gaiety somehow strikes to the soul, and one receives a supreme revelation which is yet perfectly inarticulate. Although the plagiarism which fate has been shameless enough to perpetrate in this present life would naturally, one might think, reopen the wound. There is a sense which assures us intuitively when we are running on a scent breast high. There is an oddness about the memory which is somehow annoying. It gives a feeling of shame and guiltiness. 
there is a tendency to blush. One feels like a schoolboy caught red-handed in the act of writing poetry. There is the same sort of feeling as one has when one finds a faded photograph or a lock of hair twenty years old among the rubbish in some forgotten cabinet. This feeling is independent of the question whether the thing remembered was in itself a source of pleasure or of pain. Can it be that we resent the idea of our previous condition of servitude? We want to forget the past, however good reason we may have to be proud of it. It is well known that many men are embarrassed in the presence of a monkey. When this loss of face does not incur, distrust the accuracy of the item which you recall. The only reliable recollections which present themselves with serenity are invariably connected with what men call disasters. Instead of the feeling of being caught in the slips, one has that of being missed at the wicket. One has the sly satisfaction of having done an outrageously foolish thing and gotten off scot-free. When one sees life in perspective, it is an immense relief to discover that things like bankruptcy, wedlock, and the gallows make no particular difference. They were only accidents such as might happen to anybody. They had no real bearing on the point at issue. One consequently remembers having one's ears cropped as a lucky escape, while the casual jest of a drunken skines mate in an all-night cafe stings one with the shame of the parvenu to whom a polite stranger has unsuspectingly mentioned mine uncle. The testimony of intuitions is, however, strictly subjective, and shrieks for collateral security. It would be a great error to ask too much. In consequence of the peculiar character of the recollections which are under the microscope, anything in the shape of gross confirmation almost presumes perjury. A pathologist would arise suspicion if he had said that his bacilli had arranged themselves on the slide so as to spell cephalococcus. We distrust an arrangement of flowers which tells us that life is worth living in Detroit, Michigan. Suppose that Aleister Crowley remembers that he was Sir Edward Kelly. It does not follow that he will be able to give us details of Krakow in the times of James I of England. Material events are the words of an arbitrary language, the symbols of a cipher previously agreed upon. What happened to Kelly in Krakow may have meant something to him, but there is no reason to presume that it has any meaning for his successor. There is an obvious line of criticism about any recollection. It must not clash with ascertained facts. For example, one cannot have two lives which overlap, unless there is reason to suppose that the earlier died spiritually before his body ceased to breathe. This might happen in certain cases, such as insanity. It is not conclusive against a previous incarnation that the present should be inferior to the past. One's life may represent the full possibilities of a certain partial karma. One may have devoted one's incarnation to discharging the liabilities of one part of one's previous character. For instance, one might devote a lifetime to settling the bill run up by Napoleon for causing unnecessary suffering, with the object of starting fresh, clear of debt, in a life devoted to reaping the reward of the Corsican's invaluable services to the race. The Master Therion, in fact, remember several incarnations of almost uncompensated wretchedness, anguish, and humiliation, voluntarily undertaken so that he might resume his work unhampered by spiritual creditors. These are the stigmata. Memory is hallmarked by its correspondence with the facts actually observed in the present. This correspondence may be of two kinds. It is rare, and it is unimportant for the reasons stated above, that one's memory should be confirmed by what may be called, contemptuously, external evidence. It was indeed a lucid moment for the Nazarene paranoiac in the fable when he remarked that an evil and adulterous generation sought for a sign. Even so, the permanent value of the observation is to trace the genealogy of the Pharisee from Caiaphas to the modern Christian. From Caiaphas to the modern Christian. Signs mislead, from painless dentistry upwards. The fact that anything is intelligible proves that it is addressed to the wrong quarter, because the very existence of language presupposes impotence to communicate directly. When Sir Walter Raleigh flung his coat upon the muddy road, he merely expressed, in a cipher contrived by a combination of circumstances, his otherwise inexpressible wish to get on good terms with Queen Elizabeth. The significance of his action was determined by the concourse of circumstances. The reality can have no reason for reproducing itself exclusively in that especial form. It can have no reason for remembering that so extravagant a ritual happened to be necessary to worship. Therefore, however well a man might remember his incarnation as Julius Caesar, there is no necessity for his representing his power to set all upon the hazard of a die by imagining the Rubicon. Any spiritual state can be symbolized by an infinite variety of actions in an infinite variety of circumstances. One should recollect only those events which happen to be immediately linked with one's peculiar tendencies to imagine one thing rather than another. The exception is when some whimsical circumstance ties a knot in the corner of one's mnemonic handkerchief. Genuine recollections almost invariably explain oneself to oneself. Suppose, for example, that you feel an instinctive aversion to some particular kind of wine. Try as you will, you can find no reason for your idiosyncrasy. 
Suppose then that you explore some previous incarnation. You remember that you died by a poison administered in a wine of that character. Your aversion is explained by the proverb, a burnt child dreads the fire. It may be objected that in such a case your libido has created a phantasm of itself in the manner which Freud has explained. The criticism is just but its value is reduced if it should happen that you were not aware of its existence until your magical memory attracted your attention to it. In fact, the essence of the test consists in this, that your memory notifies you of something which is the logical conclusion of the premises postulated by the past. As an example, we may cite certain memories of the Master Therion. He followed a train of thought which led him to remember his life as a Roman named Marius de Aquila. It would be straining probability to presume a connection between a this hieroglyphically recorded mode of self-analysis and b ordinary introspection conducted on principles intelligible to himself. He remembers directly various people and various events connected with this incarnation, and they are in themselves to all appearance actual. There is no particular reason why they, rather than any others, should have entered his sphere. In the act of remembering them, they are absolute. He can find no reason for correlating them with anything in the present. But a subsequent examination of the record shows that the logical result of the work of Marius de Aquila did not occur to that romantic reprobate. In point of fact, he died before anything could happen. Can we suppose that any cause can be balked of effect? The universe is unanimous in rebuttal. If then the exact effects which might be expected to result from those causes are manifested in the career of the Master Therion, it is assuredly the easiest and most reasonable explanation to assume an identity between the two men. Nobody is shocked to observe that the ambition of Napoleon has diminished the average stature of Frenchmen. We know that somehow or other every force must find its fulfillment, and those people who have grasped the fact that external events are merely symptoms of external ideas cannot find any difficulty in attributing the correspondences of the one to the identities of the other. Far be it from any apologists for magic to insist upon the objective validity of these concatenations. It would be childish to cling to the belief that Marius de Aquila actually existed. It matters no more than it matters to the mathematician whether the use of the symbol X22 involves the reality of 22 dimensions of space. The master Therion does not care a scrap of yesterday's newspaper whether he was Marius de Aquila, or whether there ever was such a person, or whether the universe itself is anything more than a nightmare created by his own imprudence in the matter of Roman water. His memory of Marius de Aquila, of the adventures of that person in Rome, in the Black Forest, matters nothing, either to him or to anybody else. What matters is this. True or false, he has found a symbolic form which has enabled him to govern himself to the best advantage. Quantum nobis protest hoc fabula Christi. Latin, how much the fable of Christ helps us. The falsity of Aesop's fables does not diminish their value to mankind. The above reduction of the magical memory to a device for externalizing one's interior wisdom need not be regarded as skeptical, save only in the last resort. No scientific hypothesis can adduce stronger evidence of its validity than the confirmation of its predictions by experimental evidence. The objective can always be expressed in subjective symbols if necessary. The controversy is ultimately unmeaning. However we interpret the evidence, its relative truth depends on its internal coherence. We may therefore say that any magical recollection is genuine if it gives the explanation of our external or internal conditions. Anything which throws light upon the universe, anything which reveals us to ourselves, should be welcome in this world of riddles. As our record extends into the past, the evidence of its truth is cumulative. Every incarnation that we remember must increase our comprehension of ourselves as we are. Each accession of knowledge must indicate with unmistakable accuracy the solution of some enigma which is produced by the sphinx of our own unknown birth city, Thebes. Newton's first law applies to every plane of thought. The theory of evolution is omniform. There is a reason for one's predisposition to gout, or the shape of one's ear in the past. The symbolism may change, the facts do not. In one form or another, everything that exists is derived from some previous manifestation. Have it, if you will, that the memories of other incarnations are dreams, but dreams are determined by reality just as much as the events of the day. The truth is to be apprehended by the correct translation of the symbolic language. The last section of the Oath of the Master of the Temple is I swear to interpret every phenomenon as a particular dealing of God with my soul. The magical memory is, in the last analysis, one manner, and as experience testifies, one of the most important manners of performing this vow.